You know, it's hard not to think about flying after all those recent crashes in Nepal and Turkey and Indonesia. Yeah, it's definitely been on people's minds. But today, we're not just going to focus on what went wrong, you know? We're going deep into how planes actually work and all the incredible tech that goes into making flying so safe. It's all about understanding the whole picture, mm. right? Not just reacting to headlines, but really getting how it all works. Exactly. So let's start with something I bet everyone's wondered when they're looking out that little window. What's the deal with jet engines versus propellers? Is one just like straight up better? Ah, the classic debate. And honestly, the answer is, it depends on what you need the plane to do. Our source makes that point really clear. There's no one size fits all when it comes to engines. Yep. So how about we break it down? How do these things even work under all that metal? What's going on? Well, picture a jet engine, like a powerful air eating machine. It just sucks in huge amounts of air, compresses it, like crazy, mixes it with fuel, and boom, ignites it. A controlled explosion. That's wild. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. It creates this super hot, high-pressure stream of gas blasting out the back, and that's what shoots the plane forward. Okay, so it's like a continuous explosion pushing you through the air. Now I noticed the source said jets are more efficient at high altitudes. Why is that? Air density. Basically, the higher you go, the thinner the air gets fewer air molecules packed together. And jet engines love that thinner air. So less air to push through makes sense. Exactly. They're designed to compress and accelerate a ton of air. Right. So the thinner it is, the less work they got to do to achieve that, which means better fuel efficiency up high. Fascinating. So the higher you go, the smoother it is for a jet. Now, what about those propellers? That'd be way different, right? Uh, yeah. They still use a turbine, but instead of directly making thrust like a jet, the turbine spins a propeller at the front. It's like a giant fan. So instead of pushing, you're getting pulled through the air. Exactly. And our source had a whole list of pros and cons. It turns out propellers have their own sweet spots. Like what kind of situation? Think fuel efficiency, especially for shorter flights. And they're great for taking off and landing on short or rough runways. Like if you're going to remote spots or island hopping. Uh, so it's like choosing the right tool for the job, powerful jet for those long hauls, nimble prop for the quick trips. When did jets really take over the skies, though, historically speaking? Mid-20th century. That's when they really came into their own. The speed and the ability to fly above most weather made them perfect for long distances and military stuff. That makes sense. So jets might be king for transatlantic flights, but props are still vital for those harder to reach places. It's cool how different engines keep the world connected in all these ways. It really is. And speaking of staying connected, let's talk about those recent crashes. The elephant in the room. Yeah, hard to ignore those headlines. But before we get into specifics, I think it's important to remember statistically flying is still incredibly safe. Absolutely. Millions of people fly safely every day. That's a testament to how much work goes into aviation safety. It's all about perspective, right? But every accident is a tragedy, and figuring out why they happen is key to preventing more in the future. What strikes me is how different the causes seem to be across these recent crashes. Like in Turkey, weather looks like a major factor. In Nepal, they're investigating pilot error. And in Indonesia, early reports point to maintenance issues. It's not like there's one big bad thing to fix. You've hit the nail on the head. Aviation safety is a whole system. The plane itself, the environment, human factors, regulations, it's all connected. It's like this giant puzzle where every piece has to fit perfectly for a safe flight, and even a tiny slip-up can have awful consequences. Exactly. It's about understanding how all these things interact and where the risks could be. So let's talk solutions. What's being done to make flying even safer? Our source had a bunch of promising developments. It seems like the industry is really proactive about this. That's the sign of a strong safety culture. Always looking for ways to make things better before something goes wrong. One area they highlight is pilot training. And that's not just about learning to fly the plane, right? Nope. It's about making tough decisions under pressure, especially when things go sideways. Think about the Nepal crash where they suspect pilot error. That shows how crucial it is to train for those unexpected situations. So it's judgment composure thinking clearly when things get rough, not just technical skills. Another thing is improved maintenance. Which seems obvious, but I bet it's more complicated than just saying, check the plane more often. Oh, yeah. It's about those detailed protocols and making sure they're followed by everyone. What? Airlines, regulatory bodies worldwide. Hmm. You need the right expertise, the right tools, and a culture that puts safety first. No cutting corners. It's a collective effort to do things right every single time. And then there's technology, obviously. Our source mentions better navigation, advanced weather, radar, collision avoidance stuff. Seems like game changers. Technology is a powerful tool. 
These advancements can help reduce human error, give pilots better info and more time to react. So get a stronger safety net overall. But they also stress that global collaboration is key for safety. How does that actually work? It's all about sharing information, data on incidents, best practices, new technologies. Organizations like ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, they set global standards and help everyone communicate and cooperate. So a worldwide team dedicated to making flying safer, no matter where you are. Exactly. But it's crucial to remember, technology can't solve everything. What do you mean? Well, it's a tool, a powerful one, but it needs humans to use it ethically and make sure it's doing what it should. We can't just rely on algorithms and sensors to fix everything. So it's a partnership. Humans and technology working together to make flying as safe as possible. Exactly. All right, so we've talked engines and how complex safety is. Now I want to go back to those recent crashes and see what we can learn. You know, instead of going through each one separately, maybe we can group them by those clauses you talked about, starting with environmental stuff. Good idea. The cargo plane crash in Turkey. That really shows how dangerous bad weather can be for flying. Yeah, the reports mentioned thunderstorms and strong winds during landing. And you mentioned wind shear earlier. What is that exactly? And why is it so risky, especially when you're trying to land? Wind shear is basically a sudden crazy change in wind speed or direction. Like imagine you're flying through calm air and suddenly, bam, you hit this pocket of wind blowing the opposite way. Like slamming into an invisible wall of wind. That's a good way to put it. And it can make you lose airspeed and altitude super fast. Even the best pilots can struggle to control the plane in those conditions. So in the Turkey crash, they think wind shear might have been a factor in the plane going down. That's what the investigation is pointing to. It's a reminder that no matter how advanced our tech gets, Mother Nature can still be a real wild card. Okay, let's move on to human error. The Yeti Airlines crash in Nepal. That's a tragic case where they're looking at pilot error as a possible cause. Keep in mind, the investigation's still going on, but some experts think the pilots might have accidentally stalled the plane while maneuvering in those mountains around Pokhara Airport. I saw pictures of that airport. It's practically squeezed into a valley with huge peaks all around. Yeah, it's a notoriously difficult airport to land at, especially <laughs> if visibility is bad. For those of us who aren't pilots, can you explain what a stall is and why it's so dangerous? So a stall happens when the airflow over the wings gets disrupted and you suddenly lose lift. Think of it like this. The wings need that smooth airflow to create the lift that keeps the plane up. If the airflow gets messed up, the wings can't do their job and the plane drops. So it's not about the engine dying. It's about the wings not being able to do what they need to. Exactly. And there are a bunch of things that can cause a stall. The angle of the plane, the speed, wind, gusts, all sorts of things. It's crazy how delicate that balance is that keeps a plane in the air. For sure. And in the Nepal crash, those black box recordings, the ones with cockpit conversations and flight data, those will be crucial to figuring out what happened in those last moments. It's like a giant puzzle. And investigators are using every piece to understand how it all went wrong. Okay, shifting gears to mechanical failure. The Indonesian crash with the smaller passenger plane, that seems to be focused on maintenance problems. It's early days in the investigation, mm -hmm. but those first reports suggest it might have been a combination of things possible engine trouble, plus not enough maintenance. It makes you realize that keeping those planes in perfect condition is absolutely essential, no matter how advanced the tech is. No doubt. Regular inspections, sticking to the maintenance schedule, having a culture of prioritizing safety, all of that is critical to prevent mechanical failures. And it's not just on the mechanics. It's everyone, airlines, regulators, everyone has to play their part. Absolutely. It's a shared responsibility to make sure every single plane is airworthy and maintained to the highest standards. So we've seen how these crashes show us different angles of aviation safety, the environment, human decisions, and how reliable the mechanics are. But I think it's important to remember what we said before. Despite these tragedies, flying is still statistically very safe. That's so important. Yeah. It's easy to forget that when you see those terrible headlines. But millions of people fly safely every day. And that shows how much work goes into constantly improving safety. The industry is always learning, adapting, and trying to make flying as safe as possible. You said it perfectly. It's not about being perfect. It's about constantly getting better, learning from mistakes, and using those lessons to make flying as safe as we can. And I think that's a really reassuring message. It's not about ignoring the risks. It's about knowing there's a whole system dedicated to minimizing those risks. Exactly. 
Now, we've talked a lot about the technical side of flying, but I want to touch on the human side, too. When a crash happens, it's not just about finding the cause and making things safer. There are real people affected families and loved ones left behind. That's a crucial point. It's yeah. easy to overlook that when we focus on the investigation. The impact on those families is huge. The grief, the loss, the search for answers. It affects so many people, not just those on the plane. Absolutely. And we need to support those who are grieving and trying to find closure. There are organizations that help families affected by these accidents, offering counseling, legal guidance, and just a sense of community during those tough times. It's about recognizing that these crashes have a lasting impact. There are human stories that continue long after the news cycle moves on. And those stories are important to remember. Definitely. Okay, now I want to bring it back to our listeners. We've covered a lot from how engines work to how safety is managed and the impact of these accidents. But what does it all mean for you the next time you're about to board a plane? That's a great question. I think the biggest takeaway is that knowledge is power. Understanding how planes work, what makes them safe, and all the work that goes into mitigating risks that can give you confidence and peace of mind when you fly. It's about being an informed passenger, not just someone along for the ride. Exactly. Pay attention to the safety briefing notice. The weather. Trust the pilots and crew. Remember, flying is a marvel of engineering and human skill. And while no system is perfect, so many people are working hard to make it as safe as it can be. I love that perspective. It's about seeing the bigger picture, appreciating all the dedication and effort that goes into making aviation safe. I couldn't agree more. All right, so we've covered the mechanics, explored the safety measures, and even touched on the aftermath of these crashes. But our source mentions another aspect of aviation that I think is worth talking about. The future of flying. Oh, I like where this is going. What's next? Well, there's so much happening right now. Electric planes, autonomous flight, even supersonic travel making a comeback. It feels like we're on the verge of some major changes in how we fly. Hey, right. The aviation industry is always evolving, and there are some really exciting developments in the works. Let's start with electric planes. The idea of planes running on batteries instead of fuel, it sounds almost too good to be true. It does sound futuristic, but it's becoming a reality. We're seeing companies developing and testing all electric planes, mainly for shorter flights in regional travel. What are the big advantages? Is it mostly about reducing emissions? That's a huge part of it. Electric planes could really lower the environmental impact of flying. Less carbon emissions, less noise pollution. That's a big deal, especially with climate change being such a concern. But are there downsides to electric planes? Like any new technology, there are challenges. Battery tech is still developing, and right now electric planes have limitations with how far they can fly and how much they can carry. So no electric jumbo jets crossing the Atlantic anytime soon? Not yet, but the technology is improving fast. It's definitely something to watch. Okay, so electric planes are taking off, so to speak. What about autonomous flight? Planes flying themselves? That kind of freaks me out, honestly. I get it. Pilotless planes can sound scary, but remember, automation is already a big part of aviation. Yeah, autopilot's been around forever. Right. Autonomous flight takes that automation further. The goal is to make the pilot's job easier and potentially even safer because you're taking out some of the risk of human error. So it's not about replacing pilots completely. It's about giving them better tools and support. Exactly. Think of it as humans and AI working together to make sure the flight is as safe and efficient as possible. Okay. That makes me feel a little better, but are we really talking about passenger planes flying themselves anytime soon? It's still early, but the technology is advancing quickly. We'll probably see it happen gradually, starting with cargo flights and then maybe moving to passenger planes as things improve and the regulations catch up. It's a fascinating idea, even if it's a little unnerving. Okay, last one on my future flight list, supersonic travel. I thought that was over after the Concorde. It did seem that way, but supersonic is making a comeback thanks to better technology and the demand for faster travel. I read about companies working on supersonic jets that are quieter and more fuel efficient than the Concorde. Was that even possible back then? Not really. The Concorde was amazing for its time, but it had limits, like that sonic boom. Right, that loud thunderclap when a plane goes faster than sound. That's why the Concorde mostly flew over oceans. Yep. New designs are using tech to reduce the sonic boom, which could make supersonic flight over land more realistic. So imagine this. You get on a plane in New York, and a few hours later, you're having lunch in L.A. No more overnight flights. That's the idea. And with new engines and lighter materials, it could actually happen. Okay, even though I'm a little wary of pilotless planes, I gotta admit, I'm excited about supersonic travel. What are some of the challenges they still need to figure out? Well, besides the sonic boom, there's fuel efficiency and cost. 
Supersonic flight uses a ton of energy, which means burning a lot of fuel. And that makes it expensive. But our source said new engines and lighter materials could help with that. They could. There's a lot of research going on in those areas. And as the tech gets better, supersonic travel could become more affordable and practical. So it's not just a fantasy. It could really be the future of flying. For sure. Yeah. It's a really interesting time for aviation. It is electric planes, autonomous flight, supersonic travel. It feels like we're on the edge of a whole new era of aviation. I agree. And like any big change in technology, we need to be smart about how we handle it. Our source talked about that too. It's not just about how cool these new technologies are. It's about making sure they're safe, sustainable, and good for everyone. Exactly. We have to think about the environmental impact safety issues and how these advancements could affect society and the economy. It's about taking a step back and making sure these innovations benefit everyone, not just a small group of people. Well said. I think that's a great place to wrap up this conversation. I agree. So to our listeners, we hope this deep dive into aviation has given you a better understanding of how planes work, all the work that goes into safety, and the incredible things happening in the future of flight. Keep being curious, keep learning, and maybe even think about a career in this amazing field. Thanks for joining us. So we talked about electric planes and even pilotless ones, but supersonic travel, making a comeback, that's the one that really gets me. I mean, I thought that was done after the Concorde. Yeah, it did seem that way for a while, right? Okay. But things have changed. The technology is so much better now. We're not talking about just copying the Concorde. It's totally new designs, new materials. Our source mentioned companies are working on supersonic jets that are quieter and use less fuel than the Concorde. Was that even possible back then with the tech they had? Not really. The Concorde was incredible for its time, but it had limitations like the sonic boom. Oh, right. That crazy loud sound when a plane breaks the sound barrier. That's why they mostly flew it over ocean. Exactly. Yeah. These new designs are using tech to try and reduce that sonic boom. Yeah. So maybe supersonic flight over land could actually work. So picture this. You're in New York. Get on a plane. And a couple hours later, you're in L.A. for lunch. No more of those red eye flights. That's the goal. And with the new engines and lighter materials they're developing, it might actually happen. Okay, I'll admit, even though I'm a little freaked out about those pilotless planes, the idea of supersonic travel is kind of exciting. Yeah. What are some of the things they still need to figure out, though? Well, besides that sonic boom, there's still the issue of fuel. And caught supersonic flight takes a ton of energy. Yeah. So you burn a lot of fuel, right. which makes it expensive. Right. But our source said new engine designs and using lighter materials could help with that. Exactly. There's so much research going on in those areas. And as the tech improves, supersonic travel could become a lot more practical. Yeah. You know, for everyday people and not just super rich folks. So it's not just a pipe dream. It could be the future of flying. Yeah. It's a real possibility. It's a really exciting time to be following all this stuff. It really is electric planes, planes flying themselves, supersonic travel. It feels like a whole new world of aviation is about to open up. I think so. And as with any big change, there are going to be challenges. We have to think about all the angles. Our source talked about that too. It's not just about how cool this new stuff is. It's about making sure it's developed responsibly. Exactly. We have to think about the impact on the environment. Safety, of course, and how these changes could affect society and the economy. It's about taking a step back and saying, okay, how do we make sure these innovations benefit everyone, not just a select few? That's a great point to end on, I think. Me too. So to our listeners, we hope this deep dive into the world of aviation has given you a better understanding of how planes work, the incredible efforts to make flying safer, and all the mind-blowing innovations on the horizon. We encourage you to stay curious, keep learning, and hey, maybe even consider a career in this amazing field. Thanks for joining us.